Hello and thank you for joining us. In today's episode, we will discuss with Mr. David Pattinson the case of Jamie Griffiths and try to understand better the consent contracts. David, can you please start by telling us more about the Griffiths case and what is it about this case that caught your attention? Uh, well, a lot of things, Alexandrina. It's just the sort of the softness with which we're willing to prosecute men and put them on the sex offenders register. I mean, Jamie is like a 19 year old kid, um, went up to a girl in the park, touched her on her waist and uh, they pretty much threw the book at him as a result of that. And um, also what um, kind of opened my eyes, uh, I think on this case was just this real, um, not only the legal risk that men are going through um, with any interaction with women whatsoever, um, but I think this just uh, shows the double standard. I mean, how many women do you know that touch a man on his waist and get five years on the sex offenders register? I mean, it's just zero cases like that in the UK. But Jamie, who's just a young kid, uh, totally harmless guy, no criminal record, they, uh, they convict him of sexual touching and, uh, yeah, pretty much ruin his whole life. And um, for, for what purpose? I mean, I don't see what that, what that achieves. Uh, I think it, it just uh, shows how out of control uh, and uh, biased against men mm. our justice system is, yeah. What did Jamie Griffiths do wrong? Well, I don't think he really did anything wrong that warrants the, the, uh, the punishment he got, Alexandrina. I mean, I think we're living in a world now where there's a total double standard towards good-looking men and bad-looking men, uh, or less desirable men, should we say. If uh, Jamie was like an A-list movie star or a celebrity, touching this girl on the waist in the park, she wouldn't have been saying I was sexually assaulted. She'd say like, here's my number, let me know when the concert is, I'll come and bring my friends, or let's go on a date or whatever it is. But as he's like a sort of a not experienced with women, woman kind of guy, or low, low attractive guy, the girl says, no, this is sexual assault, and the whole justice system backs her up. And, um, it's kind of amazing um, how, uh, how inconsistent these laws are applied. Uh, good looking guys, they wouldn't suffer any kind of conviction like this. Um, but Jamie, uh, obviously he has done. <laughs> so wait, just to understand, do you think Jamie got into this trouble just because he's not good looking enough? Well, what do you think, Alexandrina? I mean, how is it that uh, you touch a girl on the waist and then you have to go five years on the sex offenders register. I mean, you, we're, we're misleading women, aren't we? We're saying, yeah, Jamie's a sex offender, but some criminal or some thug in the neighborhood is, is not. Um, Jamie's like a sort of a soft, gentle, shy kid, um, law-abiding guy, nice family, um, you know, just trying to meet women like, like guys do at that age. And, um, yeah, obviously we punish that now as a society. Uh, we prosecute men that do this. Um, but if you're a good looking guy, uh, charismatic, uh, kind of Don Juan kind of guy, um, we don't prosecute those men because women don't make complaints against them there. They wanna get dates with them or, or build relationships with them. But the uh, less desirable men, we, we call them criminals. So that's the inconsistency. Tell me more about the victim impact statement and what was the role in this whole situation? Well, it played a big role because you and I have talked about victim impact statements before and how they're used to create a big, strong emotional um, element in the court case. And uh, this girl's victim impact statement was saying how she, um, she kind of went into this sort of psychological depression and um, mm -hmm. she failed all her... Uh, exams for Oxford University and couldn't go there and this kind of just Jamie touching her in the park you know pretty much destroyed her hopes of, of going to Oxford and uh, you know I would say to counter that Oxford University have, have dodged a bullet here I mean having this girl at that university it's just not going to work out she's not tough enough for it uh, it's a very very rigorous place I didn't go to Oxford University but I visited there many times spoke to a lot of people that did go there and uh, you know she's not cut out for it um, you know, I think they're, they're breathing a sigh of relief that, that she didn't end up going there. And uh, so they had thank Jamie for that. Well, <laughs> that's, 
that's debatable. Well, I because mean, you see a lot many of these girls people, now, Because Alex. many people, they do suffer from anxiety, depression, mental health is pretty common. And it's very uh, dangerous to say that everybody who goes to Oxford University or whatever university in this world is, you know, um, they do not suffer these problems. They are healthy people in totality. That's a bit... Well, this girl, no, no, I think you're misinterpreting because the victim impact statement implied that this girl's mental problems were as a result, solely as a result of Jamie touching her on the hip in the park. And I beg to differ. Um, I would imagine this girl had a lot of mental problems well before she met Jamie. And, um, you know, Jamie's just sort of exposed, exposed them all. Um, there's no way you can be go from a sort of totally normally healthy, um, you know, competent, capable person Jamie comes up, touches you on the hip, and then you go into this sort of psychological tailspin. I just don't think it's possible. And um, this girl's obviously got a lot of problems. Um, when you have people like this roaming around society, getting involved in organizations or interacting with other members of the public, you're putting them at risk. You're putting those organizations at risk. And uh, you know, I think it's best these people just get the mental help they need. Uh, rather than blaming, you know, some some guy in the park that, that just kind of exposed the the problems that they had. How exactly has this case affected your thinking on the concept of consent contracts? That's an excellent question, Alexandrina, and I've been thinking about that a lot. I think if you can't touch women on the hip without going on the sex offenders register for five years, um, I just think that no men are safe. Uh, with interacting with women in Britain. And uh, they've really got two choices. You either get at a consent contract, which is clearly laid out, all the terms are clearly laid out, or you just date women in, in foreign jurisdictions. Um, it's just the legal risk, uh, you get an upside from dealing with women, but the legal downside is so massive, um, it outweighs the benefit. And uh, you go and ask Jamie whether he wants to interact with women again um, in Great Britain. Uh, I would think he'll probably say, no, I, I'm not interested in doing that. And a lot of other people reading the, about this case, hearing about it in this video, they're going to be thinking, I don't want to deal with women as well because I don't want to have this, this downside risk. Uh, she could be a, a psycho. She could make a false accusation. All she's got to say is he touched me on my hip without my permission. And it's, um, it's straight into court for a conviction, yeah. To what extent are these consent contracts legally binding? That's a very, very good uh, question as well. Um, so this is kind of a new area of law because these sexual uh, misconduct things have been so watered down and are so soft now. Um, we get to the point where you have to have you have to have a consent contract with pretty much everything. And uh, I think in the coming months and years, you're going to see this more and more. And of course, the legal system they want to say these things are inadmissible in court because they want to have the court case. They want the girl to complain, the guy to be convicted, and money money for them, money from the taxpayer. If the girl's not making the accusation, none of these people are getting paid um, in, the, you know, in, the, in the judicial area. So the thing with the consent contracts at the present time is that the judge will... will the, the definition of consent is that I mean, I think we, we probably need to read it out. We can maybe put it up on the screen. But it's along the lines of the, uh, the man um, sought consent and uh, had a reasonable belief that the woman had given consent. So that's the kind of the language. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but that's pretty close to it. So if you get a girl to sign a consent contract that's written out, you've definitely sought consent. So you're covered in that area. And then if the girl signs the contract, the guy obviously has a reasonable belief that she's given consent because reading all the info, signs a name, all this sort of stuff. So from the point of view of a conviction, you're passing this threshold of, yes, I, um, I definitely sought consent proactively and I had every reasonable belief that consent was provided because there's a signature and a date and a printed name at the bottom of the contract. What do you think feminists uh, would view this uh, consent contract? Well, they hate the consent contracts because feminists want the grievance. They want the thing to complain about. They want the victimhood. If someone like me comes along and says everyone is consent contract, all that grievance goes away because women are, um, are signing the consent or they're not. And so all these romantic interactions have a, a signed legal standard to them um, unless they don't. But um, right now, the feminists want 
ambiguous consent. It's like the woman, oh yeah, she said consent or she was too drunk to give consent or whatever. It's ambiguous so that it justifies a court case. If you have a court case, it's a wealth transfer from British taxpayers to the administrative state. <coughs> and that's what, what feminists want. Well, thank you, David. Uh, and I hope uh, our viewers enjoyed listening to your thoughts on this case. Now, if, ever, if somebody wants to reach you for more information, how can they do so? Well, we have a website uh, focused on the citizens' prosecution of Alison Saunders, which is citizensprosecution.org. Um, I'd like to do another interview with you on consent contracts in due course. And uh, I think that's an area that we can explore in a lot of details. I think this case has shown that consent contracts are an absolute must with any interaction with women that's um, you know, going to involve any kind of um, yeah, inter interaction with, with proximity, um, whether it's romantic or not, just so you don't end up on the sex offenders register. And um, I think it's going to become a big thing. So, um, yeah, I want to talk about that with you. Well, this is it for today, and I'll see you next time.